Uh, welcome to Stand to Reason. I am Jay Warner Wallace, sitting in for your normal host, the actual creator of this entire thing, uh, which is Greg Kogel, who is apparently out uh, goofing off. Um, probably, if I know him, he's fishing someplace, doing something, uh, which is really, if you ask me, kind of irresponsible, don't you think? I mean, after all, he's supposed to be here hosting this radio show, and I just don't understand why he thinks you should have some time off. Uh, unless, of course, you know, it might just be because as you get to a certain advanced age, um, you have to take these advantage of these vacation opportunities, right? Because you probably only have two or three more left. And so I, I only say that because Greg and I are, he's a little bit older than me, but I know Greg is so conscientious that he'll actually listen to the radio show, uh, listen to, you know, he'll, he'll hear it. So I'm just waiting to see when he's going to text me. <laughs> If I could say something that will provoke him to a text, maybe I have, I hope I have. Anyway, Jay Werner Wallace sitting in to talk to you about the things that count most that are most important. Those issues related to number one, how do we think well? And two, how do we think well about uh, the existence of God, God, uh, God's word, um, the biblical reliability, all kinds of questions you could ask. And I want you to also think about calling in to ask me uh, questions as well. If you're a regular listener to this show, you know, that's really the format of the show, right? It is for us to be able to interact with each other. So I, I hope that you will be able to do that as well. Now, um, this, let me say this, uh, give me the call in number first. Uh, we're here today at 855-243-9975. 9975 Now, if you don't uh, get a call in a day, write that down because you can call in next week. Uh, what I want to talk about first before I begin is uh, I note I got an email last week from somebody who has been listening to, has been you know watching everything that Standard Reason does, as I do as well. And I had missed this, <laughs> that Tim Barnett had been talking about uh, the training model that we created a number of years ago when I was a youth pastor, this model to equip young people. And I want to just, uh, I got so many questions about, well, how did you think that up? And, and you know, have you actually implemented this? And of course we have. And let me just kind of, I want that to take the first part of the show today before I've got calls and people are already on hold um, to just talk about the training model for young people. If you've got someone in your family who is a junior higher or upper elementary, or certainly if they're a high schooler, you're probably wondering if you've done a good job uh, equipping them, preparing them, even uh, helping them to disciple them, as a matter of fact, as, as Christians. And we all have stories of people in our families who have walked away from the faith. And as troubling as that is, um, we always wonder, what well, could I have done something better? Now, now look, because God has given each of us free agency, I always tell parents, relax. We, you, you can do everything you're supposed to do, and your kids still have their free agency to walk away from the faith. That happens all the time. But there are some things we can do to uh, increase the odds our kids will not walk away. And I'll just tell you what I share with you, what I did with my own two sons uh, when they were in youth ministry with me when I was their youth pastor. Now, uh, this is a process that we we learned by mistake. We, we made a hundred mistakes and we, we had students who came through our youth pastor who walked away from the faith. And we thought, what could we have done better to equip them? And I, I started to dig deep into my own model of training uh, as a police officer. And I d developed a paradigm called T-R-A-I-N. That's the mod, that's the, uh, the paradigm uh, for uh, the acronym for training students. And I tell people all the time, we've got to stop teaching students. We've got tons of teachers. We've had teachers for generations. And let's face it, students are still walking away from their faith. We have to flip toward a training model. Training is different than teaching. And the training is why I developed the acronym. Because I, I started this probably 20 years ago. And I've written about it in two books. Uh, there's a chapter in Forensic Faith, which we published in 2017, and a chapter I wrote with... Uh, with Sean McDowell, and so the next generation will know, which we published in 2019. And in both of those, the first I introduced it uh, in 2017, but in 2019, I really wanted to dive deep. So if you are a parent, an educator, or a youth pastor, and you're wondering how to implement the training model with your own kids, you can find that, and so the next generation will know. Uh, so let me just cover it real quickly with you. If you've been thinking about well, what can I do with my own kids? Well, the T-R-A-I-N is the, the, the acronym. The first T is for testing. Look, police officers typically don't know what they don't know until they get in the field and then they fail. Now, hopefully you don't fail and lose your, lose your life. But this does happen on occasion. But if you get out in a, a, a situation in the street and you don't fare so well and you get banged up and scarred up, um, more than likely you're going to hop in the gym at some point and I maybe mean, you're going to hop in a dojo where you're going to learn how to do some, some ground fighting. You're going to do something because you just got tested and you felt like you didn't 
pass the test. And you don't want that to happen again. And often when we work with student groups, what we try to do is go in and test them, show them why they need training to begin with. If you don't test, you're not likely to be motivated to train at all. And when I started this years ago, we do this with, uh, with Brett Kungel back when Brett was part of Stand to Reason. And we would just go in and role play. So if you've seen the multitude of role playing uh, videos that are out there, um, we started that years ago. Uh, but we've seen now, you see Sean McDowell's got many of these posted. Brett's got a number of these posted. I think other members of Stand to Reason have these posted online as well. Just type in atheist role play or Mormon role play. Uh, and what you do is you'll see that we will role play as the um, person who holds a different worldview. And after students struggle to, to actually um, defend what they believe as Christians, you know, you give an hour and a half where they don't know that the role player is not really holding is actually a Christian who's role playing. They think this person is actually somebody who holds that worldview. They get so uncomfortable at their inability to defend what they believe that afterwards, when you reveal that they are actually role playing, uh, they are like shocked and relieved. And we always ask two questions. How do you think you did defending your faith? And they'll rank themselves <laughs> low because they did a, per a terrible job. And then we'll ask, well, how did you treat the person? Because what we discovered is as you lose the ability to defend what you believe, people can get a little bit nasty. Um, and, and Christians who are trying to defend their faith that they feel like they're losing, and you see this online, which is why it's so important for us. Confident people do not get nasty. Chihuahuas make a lot of noise in the yard because they are small and they feel like they're going to get eaten at any moment. But Great Danes don't make any noise. And if you want to have the calm kind of resolve of the Great Dane, you have to know something. So the testing process gets kids, students ready to take the next step. Then what we do is we raise the bar, we raise the expectations, we require more of them. That's the R. And I learned this a long time ago in youth ministry is that, you know, your lead pastor is more than likely, if you're a youth pastor, just happy that you're getting kids to show up. And often we do those things that really don't amount to much, right? We, we do a lot of games and pizza and fun and and fun trips. And we're just trying to like gather a crowd, it seems like. Meanwhile, at home, their parents are expecting the most of them and have got them tutors and they're in international baccalaureate classes and advanced placement classes. We expect and require a lot of our high school students in their academic work. Yet when they get to the church, it's like, you know, just show up. That's good enough. No, we can require more. When I was teaching our students, I always tried to teach them at like a entry level, college level, even if I had freshmen uh, in the in the group, I actually had junior high in the group. And I discovered that everyone was able to pull up there and meet the expectations, especially after we had tested them and they realized that didn't feel good. So there's the T and the R, the A. Now, look, you got to arm your kids. That's what the A stands for. You got to give them content. And I think the content shifting a little bit. We have to show our students not only what is true about Christianity to make the case that God exists, but also make the case that God is good, that Christianity is good. And a lot of that's going to be by introducing them to a lot of bad ideas proportionally. We're going to, I'm going to, if there's someone's writing online, I'm going to bring that in. I want to share with our students every objection they're going to get before they get it when I'm not with them. I always say that if you're going to hear the objection, I want you to hear it when we're together rather than not when you're at a, you know across the state at some university campus. So we're going to have to show them what is being said against the faith and then equip them with material uh, that, that makes the case from a Christian perspective. You show them both sides. And help them to see why one side is logically uh, flawed in some way. So that's the, that's the third thing. That's the T, R, and the A. We've now tested. We require more of them, and we arm them. Now, the next thing is, is the thing that I actually believe changes everything. So I want to take a second to tell you. Now, and I think that how you learn to train is by doing the I. And so I learned to do this by taking trip after trip after trip <laughs> until I was exhausted. Um, it, it, it's involving students in the battlefield of ideas. That's the I, involving. And, and that's something you have to do because it turns out if you thought, well, I could change my entire youth ministry by simply studying more and um, maybe um, taking a course. Well, yeah, you could, or maybe you, uh, trying hard. Yeah, that's, you want to change your youth ministry? You want to change your church? You want to change your personal life? You don't do it. 
with anything more involved or complicated than a calendar. A calendar changes everything. Because what we did is we, after we tested these students in any number of areas, we said, how did that feel? Terrible. I'll tell you what we're going to do. It's going to get worse because in eight weeks, I have scheduled a one week trip with all of you. Now, and, and I tell them the destination and you're going to experience some stuff there. It's going to be much harder than what you just experienced with this little test we ran. And if you want to be ready for that, you're going to have to train with me. And what I mean is, if, you're, if we were teaching our students theology, they weren't interested in theology until I brought in a Mormon role player or a Mormon bishop. We brought in many Mormon bishops who were just Mormon bishops. They're happy to come. And after they failed to be able to defend their faith against the Mormon bishop, they decided maybe it was important to um, study theology. Well, I don't want to just teach them. So I calendared an event, a trip. You know, it turns out that that's what turns teaching into training is the calendar challenge. Boxers train. MMA fighters, they train. Why? Because they've got a fight coming. A lot of these guys get fat in between fights. But when they calendar the fight, they suddenly begin training. And they lose a bunch of weight and they're in the best shape of their life on the eve of the fight. That's because they're about to enter the ring. Uh, you will train when you know you've got a battle coming. So I knew I had to set the calendar for the battle so that our students would see the urgency with which they needed to learn this. And by the way, our trips were so much fun. They weren't just all you know drudgery. This was like a chance to go be with all the other students. We would always calendar in some other activities. But for theology, I decided we're going to take them to Salt Lake City. It's about a 12-hour drive from where we are in Los Angeles County. And we'll just drive out to Salt Lake City. We'll spend a week on the temple grounds, spend a week in Provo, part of the week in Provo, that community that's outside of BYU. We'll spend a day on the campus of BYU. We're going to put them in the most um, strenuous evangelistic uh, settings in which they can share evangelism. They can share the truth with Mormons. And by the way, Mormons are more than willing to have conversations. It's not like other places you go. Mormons see you, the Christians, as the lost people group. So they are more than willing to engage you in a conversation. I learned more on those mission trips than any. Look, we designed the trained paradigm because we were spending so much time in the field. And we just learned how to prepare for that. That's why if you want expertise in this, you can't just talk about it. You have to have done it. And that's why I want to encourage you. There are ways for you to get in that game. But I'll get to that in a second. But so that we would take our trips to Salt Lake City to teach theology. We would take our trips to UC Berkeley to teach philosophy. And we would also take trips to Islam trips we did. We also would do, I always say that we, you have to, it's, it's about, you know, it's tab training. I talk about this and so the next generation will, will know also. It's, you're talking about theology, apologetics, and behavior. Those three things. I would toggle between those three, those three things for four months every year. And behavior, sometimes it's about issues like social justice. What does that even mean? How do you serve the community? What, what, is that, what are the principles that we think are, are valuable there? So we would toggle between those three, and we would set events in all three categories. And then the teaching for the eight weeks prior to the event became training because they know they're getting ready for a challenge. And that's what we have to do. This model does not work unless you're willing to set the calendar. And you're not going to learn how to do the model or even teach it to others unless you've been involved in the calendar. So I want to encourage you. How do you do this, right? I mean, if, if, if you're not a, a youth pastor, how do you take people up to you know, Berkeley? Well, look, you can go to a campus for one day if you're a parent. We used to use surveys. And we've got those surveys available in that book so the next generation will know. So you can see what kind of survey we're using. And that survey is just simply a question you ask on the campus. And that, that question uh, gets you in conversations. You can do that as a parent, especially once your students are like freshmen, sophomores. You don't want to wait till they're seniors. It's too late. You need to work a lot earlier and bring them on the campus. And students are on the campus and they'll, they'll engage you about these kinds of questions. You can do shortened versions of this. We used to do a lot of street evangelism using surveys. Just to kind of assess the spiritual nature of the people we were talking to. It always got us involved in great conversations. And so you can do things, and we've got a list of those in that book. But my point is, if you're a parent or a teacher or a youth pastor and you're thinking, well, how do I, in, well, how do I get my students to engage these issues? If you don't put something on the calendar, it's all just talk. And talk is cheap. Do something. <laughs> that's what it comes down to. And that's something you can put on your calendar. And the last thing, of course, is the end. It's the nurture. 
And the reason why it's so important, because we discovered this time and time again when we would take these trips, like you learn how to nurture students in these kinds of events, these kinds of trips, by just doing them. If you're a parent and you take your students to a one day trip to a university using this approach we've been talking about, you'll have to have conversations afterwards because you're going to encounter all kinds of opposition. You're going to encounter all kinds of other ideas and your students are going to need you to help navigate those ideas. Look, if you've ever watched a fight and you'll see that in the center ring, they've got the two fighters, right? And they're waiting for the decision and the referees standing there with a hand on each one of these fighters. And if you look at the two fighters, it usually, if you hadn't seen the fight, you wouldn't even know who the winner is because both of them look really beat up, <laughs> but one of them is the winner. It turns out that even if you're successful in whatever your goals may be, you're going to have some bumps and bruises, just like the loser does. And I'm not trying to, this, I don't want you to think of this as like winning and losing. Um, Cause that's not what we're going to do here. We're just going to examine ideas, but they, it will be times and points of tension. Uh, we've taken students who were underprepared. We let in the first year, we let some of those students come up with their friends and their friends had only attended half the training sessions. We never did that again. We found that those students were not well prepared and they were probably injured by the process more than they were strengthened by the process. We just know that this train acronym, you have to stick to the process and the process is you have to train. You have to arm them with something over a period of time. So they're ready to be able to answer the call, but you have to learn how to nurture. And I will say this about nurturing. Uh, most uh, studies of doubt have revealed that if you don't have a place where you can express your doubt comfortably as a young person, you are far more likely to walk away than you are if you've got a place where I could express my doubt, even though my parents maybe didn't have good answers. The, the, what, what turns doubt into deconstruction is basically the inability to even ask the question because I fear that I'm going to be judged in some way or that this question is out of bounds for our family. What we have to do as nurturers is simply, it's called a ministry of presence. Sometimes all I'm going to do is I want to sit and hear the objection. Now, I may have a response. I may have something I could add to this, or I may have to say, you know, that's a really good, that's a really good thing to think about. That's a really difficult question. I'd like to, I'd like to do some research with you. I'd like to try to answer that together. But I think what happens is if we are not good nurturers, if we say, well, look, I've already told you this, that, like, if you're going to ask that question again, <laughs> we may not say that, but if that's our attitude, toward our kids, they know it. And that's what leads to the biggest problem. So sometimes nurture is just about accepting the possibility of a question. And that is the acronym, T-R-A-I-N. And we developed this 20 years ago and, and there's a lot written about it in those two books. I hope that's helpful to you. And you can even go on our website at coldcasechristianity.com. I think I must have 10 or 15 videos there that talk about the training acronym. Now, before we have a break and we're about to do that, I just want to encourage you uh, with an opportunity that, that Stand a Reason offers. Now, look, we just finished a season of Reality Apologetics, and you can learn more about that at realityapologetics.com. But I want you to know that they've already kind of released, maybe you've heard it through these uh, channels, that the theme and the speakers have already been selected for next year. I'm going to read it to you. It's, a, it's called Man or Maker. This is the series that we're going to be doing next year. Man or Maker, who says who you are? And the speakers next year are going to be Sean McDowell, uh, uh, Lanej Garrison is a great speaker, and Christopher Yuan, a good friend of ours, and Tripp and Megan Alman. So you're not going to want to miss that series. They're going to be, again, in six locations. We'll be in Costa Mesa, Seattle. We'll be in Minneapolis, Dallas, uh, Philadelphia, and Augusta, Georgia. So I want you to at least look on the calendar uh, and mark that, because if you're training yourself or getting ready to take a dive with your students as tra and training them, whether you're a pastor, a teacher, or a parent, you're going to want to attend this conference and bring your students. We are always, always, well, now I think we are always sold out. So I want you to at least consider getting that on your calendar. All right, we'll take a break. And when we come back, we'll have calls from you uh, right here at Stand to Reason. Well, thanks for coming back with us here at Stand to Reason. Jay Warner Wallace sitting in for Greg Kolkel. Uh, it's really, you just heard Tim Barnett on that uh, little um, clip. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but they, we, it's STR University is online. You can actually visit it at trainingstr, uh, training .str .org, training .str .org. And uh, Tim's got a new uh, course out. It's called Are Science and Faith Compatible? 
And I think this is really one of those things that uh, is, is almost always a hot topic. Um, and I get a lot of requests on the talks that we do in this area as well. And I just think this is something you can actually start that course for free and it's worth doing. And of course, you know, Tim is uh, his material is so accessible. I think you're going to want to get over there and do that right away. All right. Now let's do uh, to take some phone calls here. We'll start with Ron in McHenry, Illinois. Uh, Ron, how are you? Hello there, Jim. I'm well. How are you? Doing well. Good to talk to you. Oh, good to talk to you. Good. Yes, likewise. It's really great to talk to you. I like your material. Thanks a lot for all the work you and the other guys put into it. Well, thanks, Ron. I appreciate it. So, so my question was along the lines of you do. I really like the way you lay out the um, there must be something outside the room to explain what's inside the room, uh, especially in regards to the existence of God or the fact that we have, there is a universal moral standard that applies to all humans. But a lot of times when I'm work, when I'm talking with people that have either rejected the Bible for one reason or another, or they're not interested in it, so quoting scripture to them doesn't help, but they get to the point, they'll agree, okay, well, there's a God. And yeah, there's some things you should do and shouldn't do. But the next thing is kind of very deistic. It's like, well, but so what? Well, what does it matter? Like Paul in Acts 17, you know, told them, you know, that there's going to be a judgment that, you know, God winked at this, but now he calls everybody to repentance and there's going to be a judgment. And I can say things like that. But then when they ask, well, according to who? So do you have something, um, some kind of an outside the room sort of approach to the idea that there will be a judgment? Okay, um, so yeah, let me just um, kind of catch everybody up on the idea of insider outside the room. This is a, from a book I wrote sure. called God's Crime Scene. And what I really tried to t talk about here is that when you're working a death scene, trying to determine if it's a crime scene, you ask the simple question, can I explain everything that's in the room by staying in the room for an explanation? So I've got a dead body in the room and there's a pistol by his side. He's got a single gunshot. Uh, injury, but you know, I can see that there's you know, no evidence that anybody else was in the room other than him, and it is his gun. And I can explain the wounds as being self inflicted. Well, then I don't have to go outside the room for an explanation, I can stay inside the room, and we know that there's no intruder, and therefore it's not a murder, it's going to be something like a suicide. Okay, that's a simple way inside or outside the room. You could flip that to the entire known universe and ask the question Can I explain everything inside the universe? In other words, everything in a universe made of space, time, and matter with the laws of physics and chemistry, or are the better explanations for what we see inside the room a cause outside the room? Because if we did find that that was the best explanation, we'd know we have an intruder. And I think there are a number of attributes of the universe that are best explained by a cause outside the room. So that's why I took that approach when I was first looking at the case for God's existence. And I simply asked the question, I think there are eight things. One of them, of course, is objective moral truth. But it, really what we're trying to say in that kind of an approach and in that entire book, God's crime scene doesn't reference scripture at all because the point in that book was I, at that time I was at that time in my life as a 35 year old, I wasn't willing to open your Bible to get an answer from your Bible on any of these questions. I needed to know, was there a good reason to believe there was a God? Now, again, this doesn't make a case specifically for the Christian God, but if there is no God, there is no Christian God. So I needed to know if that first domino was, was, you know, was reasonable to push. So, so I simply uh, took that approach and I did it with just looking at science and philosophy. And I think there, that's the approach I often take when people have questions about, well, is this reasonable? Yes, you can make a case from Scripture for the judgment. You can make a case for Scripture that God is the perfect balance. And this is something, if you think about it, um, just writing another book right now, which talks about this, that, that if you had to do a quick definition of what it is, that God, what, what is God's nature, you could simply say that God is the one being who holds justice and mercy grace and truth, law and love in perfect balance. Nobody else does that other than God. And every admonition of scripture, if you think about it, is God writing to us and saying, guys, you're either being far too loving and not enough discernment or far too judgmental and not enough grace. It's that we're always out of balance. Isn't it interesting that John says that, that Jesus came in the fullness of truth and grace, grace and truth. Now, when he said that, he wasn't just saying, yeah, he's a good guy. He's saying, he's talking about the deity of Jesus because no being has the fullness of those two things. 
except for God. So this is a claim of deity. So what's interesting about that is that you if you can look at this, the nature of, of do we have good reason to believe um, that justice is, is waiting for us? Look, one thing we can say is this. We are in a universe right now. We are living a life right now, in which justice will not be met for most people. I see this all the time. I, mean, I can I can solve cases uh, that are 30 years old. I have several, though, where we solved them, uh, you know, 30 years later to find out our suspect had been dead for 15. So we solved the case, but he never saw justice in this life. Yet we seek this. We yearn for this. We yearn for a lot of things that we're not going to experience in our fullness here on this side of the grave. And if, if, if atheism is true, you can just say, well, get over it. Tough luck. Sorry. Some of you are going to get killed. Some of you are not. Some of you are going to get killed and your murderer is going to get away with it. Oh, well, tough luck. That's all you could really say. But to be honest, you couldn't even say that that would be bad if, the, if, if atheism is true, because how would you ground the moral act of murder? You could say, I don't like murder, and we as a group don't like murder, but you couldn't say it's really wrong because there is no transcendent objective standard by which you're actually measuring it. So there are lots of reasons for us to think that look, this is really wrong. And some of the things that we, I see are really are going to require justice. They, they, are, they are punishable acts. Let me just say one way you might want to approach it. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, Ron, but it, it turns out that how you live today is largely determined about by what you think will happen in the future. Your concerns about the future have an impact on how you live today. Uh, in other words, um, there's an entire field of psychological study on this called terror management theory that simply says that every human behavior is predicated on our fear or anxiety about death, our thought of death, called you know, our moral saliency, how much we think about our mortality, our mortality saliency, or our death anxiety. Because we are the one species that actually can sense that we're getting older and that death is coming, that other animals don't do this. We do it, and we have that sense of this. And what, where you think you are headed determines the quality of life you're going to have today. You don't even realize how many decisions you're making today because this mortality salience is in the back of your mind or your death anxiety is in the back of your mind. And that's a field of study that I think is fascinating and it's growing. And of all the ways that people process their death anxiety, Christianity offers a solution like no other solution. So I think that most people, whether they're believers or not, will know that they are afraid. They have some anxiety, either that they're going to, their lives are going to end, simply that, or that their lives are going to end and they might face a God who they're not quite sure they're ready to face. And or but really that issue of, of 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 your life ending has a big impact on your on your behavior today, whether you're a Christian or not. And I think that's an evidence you can you can talk to people about that that they all like almost everyone believes there is somebody who's done something that is worthy of punishment if there is a God that punishes, right? We it's, 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 we all think that we're going to be you know get, uh, you get rewards and no punishment, but we all think there's somebody out there who should get a punishment. We we all love the idea of heaven, hate the idea of hell, but recognize that there are people who are probably are deserving of hell. And I think these these intuitive feelings we have, these intuitive kind of sense we have of, of the future is best clarified by Christianity. As a matter of fact, the idea of what people call the persisting self, that that when the people who have less death anxiety, if they have a sense that after they die, their persisting self will continue into eternity. Not that that they will be reincarnated because they would persist, but not as themselves. Not that they would just be dead in the dirt because then they wouldn't persist, but the idea that they would persist as the same soulish creature into eternity uh, changes the way you live today. We just lost Tim Keller last week. Um, and Tim was once, he had pancreatic cancer. And for the last five years, he will tell you that um, he was living with the full expectation. The full, it changed the way he spent the last five, he knew it was coming. He was still, he wrote books. He was still inspiring. He, 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 and he, he died with full confidence that he was ready to go home. That changes the way we live today. And that's not necessarily about judgment, but that is about the life beyond the grave. 
And if there's a good, loving God beyond the grave who is the fullness of grace and truth, he's not only going to bless those who love him, he is going to judge those who have done something worthy of judgment. That's why he's described as having the fullness of mercy and truth, or grace and truth, or mercy and justice. So I think that a God that is not just is probably not worth believing in. So in the sense that I would just kind of offer that to people who are even thinking about they, if they've already taken a step with you and believe that there's a God, well, what would define the nature of God? It is that balance of mercy and justice. And it's about us helping people to see that they are not, you cannot have one without the other. And anytime they are out of balance, if, if you've got a God of all mercy and no justice, well, then all that mercy is simply an empty platitude because you aren't just and how you dispense your mercy even. So it turns out that if we believe there is a God, uh, we would want to at least examine the notion that that God would possess justice and and mercy in perfect balance. Hmm. Okay. Does that make sense? So, oh well, yeah, it does. It definitely. I mean, that was one of the pieces that was in my mind is that it seems like all of us have an innate sense of judgment. Um, and it's not fair is a phrase that everybody knows and nobody learned. It. I mean, that's just built into us. That's actually so been I, demonstrated, um, by the way. What you just said has been demonstrated. They've done studies with children who, uh, before they're, they, that it's not fair notion is uh, one of our mm -hmm. basic intuitions, and it doesn't have to be taught. So, so yes. I see there could be some, mm -hmm. yeah, there could be some, some line of discussion there since it's so, it's so ingrained into just who we are just like our morals that we don't like to be stolen from or hurt or lied to, uh, that it must come from outside of us. At least, yeah, again, not you're not going to convince anybody that doesn't want to be convinced. But well, I appreciate your time. Well, I mean, and the beauty really, of this too, Ron, something I've been praying on. Yeah, and the beauty of this too, Ron, is you're talking but, about people who already have taken that first step with you. They already believe there is some kind of a God. But so what? Now, that's, that's a good point, though. I think we have to be focused on, and I'll take a few minutes before we cut for another break here. Um, I think that I want to be focused with my, my students, especially um, that, that the so what is, I think, a harder that that kind of apathyism is a bigger threat we talk about than, than atheism. Right. This idea. OK, so so what? Um, but it turns out that that um, people and they've done studies on this death anxiety. And it turns out that you claiming an identity as a Christian or claiming an identity as a religious believer does not protect you from death anxiety. It's when you actually believe your claims. It's when you are committed to your claims that you actually are protect yourself from the, the negative. And by the, and the list of things that death anxiety causes is it's unbelievable what it does to people's lives. Um, and they've done studies on all of that as well. But to avoid that, it's, it turns out that just claiming a religious identity does not help you a bit. As a matter of fact, um, you'll be less committed. You'll be less. You'll be more fearful than atheists who are committed to atheism. But if you are a religious believer who is committed and understands why, this is another thing I, we got to talk about too. Is that this idea of hope, hope that we have. I think we've taken that term and we think of it like I, I hope for a, a, an afterlife. I hope for heaven or I hope there's a God who's just that way. We're using the word hope in the, in the secular way. It's like wishful thinking. Oh, I, I hope it's true. I mean, I wish it's true. I mean, I, I you know, I was like, like, like hopeful think wishful thinking. That is not how hope is defined in scripture. Hope is the, the firm certainty you have about something for which you've got good evidence, but it's not sitting right in front of you. Now, that kind of hope, that kind of certainty is what protects you from death anxiety. So, so I think waking people up to their, their apathy is super helpful to, to this, this notion that I'm hoping for things that are unseen based on the evidence of what I can see. And people who have that kind of certainty, I always say it this, this way in, in Cold Case Christianity, the first book, where I talk about the guy who was wearing that bulletproof vest, right? And he's, he's, he just trusted he got caught, you know, with his, his gun was drawn from the suspect pointed right at his chest. He was an officer and he, he didn't know what to do. He, he, he did, he knew he was, he, he'd lost the draw and he was going to take a round from the suspect was going to shoot at him. 
And so he had a couple of choices. He could try to run, duck, do what he just decided. He was wearing his bulletproof vest. He had seen that vest stop bullets in the range. So he just stood calmly and took the first couple of rounds while he got his gun out of his holster. Now that's pretty courageous. But the reason why he had certainty is because he had seen it do its job previously. And if you don't have that kind of confidence, you're not going to stand calmly. You're going to start running. <laughs> you're going to do whatever else you have to do. But if you've got confidence and you get that kind of confidence on the basis of having examined the evidence, if Christianity had no way to examine the evidence, and then the most hope we would probably ever have would be the same kind of silly hope and wishful thinking that, that, that others might have in any worldview. But that's not the Christian view. The Christian view is that Jesus came and said, I've, I've given you evidence. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, at least believe on the evidence of these miracles. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, believe in the testimony of others, God the Father, John the Baptist. I'll tell you what, I'll stick around for 40 days after the resurrection and give you much more evidence that you can then trust what's true. Well, when you do that for 40 days, after you've risen from the grave, it, why do you think those apostles were on, on fire in the first century? Why is it that it seems like we've never seen anything like it since? Because there hasn't been a generation who was had firsthand contact with the risen Christ for 40 days. That kind of confidence changes everything. And we can gain that kind of confidence, but we have to actually have done some work to understand why this is evidentially true. So that'll change the way we behave, I think, with each other. Anyway, I'm really super glad you uh, you called. Thanks for that call, Ron. Thank you. Okay, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we've got another call on the line, and you can call in as well. Uh, and uh, I'd love to talk to you about the stuff that really is the most important. And we'll talk to you after this break at Stand to Reason. Jay Warner Wallace back with you here sitting in for Greg Kokel this week, who's out, I think, just uh, taking a well-deserved uh, break. I tried to antagonize him a little bit to see if he was uh, listening. You know, I haven't gotten a text from him, so I guess he's not paying attention. I called him old. I said he was lazy. Did I say he was lazy? I tried to say he was lazy. Well, anyway, I tried a couple of things, but we'll see if he gives me a call. Anyway, um, you can call to ask questions. I wish you would. Uh, it's 855 855- Two four three nine nine seven five eight five five two four three nine nine seven five. We've got a couple calls on the line, but I've got room for you as well. So please give us a call. And now we're going to go to Jared in Lawrence, Kansas. Jared, how are you doing? I'm good, Jim. How are you? Doing well. Good, good to hear your voice. Yeah, thank you. So my question has to do with sharing the gospel with professing, believing family members who you have some reason for concern about whether they've truly been born again. So just for a little background on my situation, I've got three living grandparents. Two of them are Roman Catholic. One is, I would say, liberal Presbyterian. And there's just conversations that either I've had with them or other believers in our family have had with them that has made, I guess, has made me concerned about where, you know, where they're at with God. Um, so a couple of examples would be, um, you know, they've, they've said things like kind of implying that maybe people can be saved or reach eternal life outside of Jesus or outside of Christianity. Um, I one time was discussing same-sex marriage and what the Bible talks about that with one of them, and they said, well, I don't really agree with that because I believe God is a God of love. Um, and then another uh, instance kind of challenging our the, the believers in the family for being committed to the Bible because we we're they, they were saying, well, you guys don't eat pork, you know, you don't follow all the Old Testament ceremonial laws. And so just conversations like that that have made me concerned. And so I guess I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts or advice in terms of how how to effectively witness to those people or 
you know, at least be able to plant or water the seed in a way where, because I can imagine ways that I could go about it where they might respond and say, well, yeah, we're, I, I'm a Christian too. I believe in Jesus. We're on the same team here. And so I'm trying to get things across in a way that's effective. And I'm just wondering if you have thoughts on how I might do that. Well, of course, you called the right um, ministry because you know that Greg's work is right in this category, these kinds of conversations in which you are really going to ask questions that highlight needs or highlight um, ways that we think as humans that are maybe necessarily or can, can become, sometimes be misguided. And if you've read Tactics, you already know that there's a way to do this. It's very gracious. That actually, But the question becomes like still a matter of focus, right? Because you could have all of that tactical approach. And I suggest if anyone's listening to this for the first time that you, you need to get a copy of tactics because that's really where you're going to learn that conversational approach um, and how to, act, how to, how to navigate uh, conversations by way of questions, the questions that don't feel that are so threatening or so um, uh, dogmatic that you burn bridges before you even get it halfway across. So I think that's something you can, you want to consider for sure. But even if you had all those tactics in place, the question becomes like, where do I initiate this? Like, what, what do I do? I just wait until somebody says something. And then when I do that, there's still a number of, of choices you have in terms of where you can lead a conversation by what kinds of questions should I ask? I get all that. So let me tell you what I do. And I've got, I'm surrounded by people who are not Christians. And, and I do have though my share that kind of been married um, and the family on one side or the other. You know, remember, I, I didn't have any Christians growing up. Um, I had people who were very lukewarm, uh, who were maybe in my orbit, um, but really weren't, they weren't biblically literate. We didn't uh, have a Bible. I didn't ever read a Bible. I did. And my, my dad was not somebody actually, I have a Bible that was given to my dad and it's sitting back here on my bookshelf. Um, I forget how I got it, but I know he's never opened it. Um, but I'm glad to have it. I can't get him to to get me interested, but that's not the problem. You have a different problem. You have a problem with people who actually identify as Christians, but maybe have never opened their Bible. And that's where I would like you to focus. So I think there's a number of hot topic issues that often are the, the way into a conversation. And I don't always think that's the best way in. And what typically happens is you're sitting around with your family and some hot topic issue comes up that you don't agree with. And it's like, there's a need. We feel like this sense of defending. We want to defend what Jesus has to say about these issues. And part of the problem is, is that if, if the person you're talking to is a Christian who never reads their Bible, who doesn't make that a part of their daily life. And it was hard for me when I was working full time. Now I was committed to doing that because I was so fascinated with it. But I can see why now as a retired guy who's got time with my wife, that we can make this a larger part of our every day. And we do. But it's, it's a lot easier when you're my age than it would be if you were younger. But I'll tell you this, my whole goal is to get people interested because I think that the Bible does all the heavy lifting for you. If, if I actually am reading scripture and, and believe that the scripture is telling me something true, if I know my Bible, it's much harder to distort my Bible because I know the connectivity between different verses, different passages, different concepts in scripture. It's not as easy to t kind of cherry pick out a piece if I'm if I'm familiar with the entire breadth of the Old and New Testament. But the problem, of course, is that most people will say they're Christians because they drive by a church twice a month, you know, or, or once a month. And that seems to be good enough. In, in the same time, those same folks are completely dedicated to other issues that aren't nearly as important. And, and that what we have to do is help our people, the people we love, our family members, our friends, to be as passionate about their religious beliefs, their, their beliefs as Christians, as they are about their sporting beliefs or their hobby beliefs or their political beliefs. Because it turns out they are very passionate about that. And they'll spend time every day reading news articles, listening to, to content creators who are talking about politics or whatever it is, yet they won't spend near as much time um, investigating the claims of scripture. So I, I'm less inclined now to, to, to start a conversation that is about the hot topic issue than I am to talk about why it's so important as Christians to know our scripture, to know our Bible. It might just be you, at least initially, talking with your family about how your life changed just by being a, 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 a consistent Bible reader. Just knowing the mind of God through scripture 
it is life changing, and it it creates a sense of calm um, that is could not be found anywhere else. And there's times when I don't even want to pay attention to what's rotating in the world around me because it's I'm not going to be able to change it. What I really want to know is what does God say about something? What does God's word say about something? So if you're going to have a conversation, that's where I would try to to get. And here's how I do it with young people. It turns out that every important issue, like marriage, it really comes down to like what does Scripture say about it. And every important, I always say this way: the gospel fixes every kind of stupid you can think of. If it's marriage stupid, or politics stupid, or crime and justice stupid, whatever that you think is stupid, or you think the other side holds a stupid position, it turns out that the that the, the adjudicator of the gospel solves the problem. And, and it has, at least it has a, a, a claim for solving the problem. So what I try to do is just talk about how the gospel addresses that issue and why I know from scripture that this is the actual response to it. But I always want to lean back on not so much the hot topic as I'm leaning back on, are you reading scripture? Have you, like, what have you gotten recently out of scripture? That's a good question to ask. Like, what's the thing you learned this week from scripture? A lot of the people we know are going to have no answer to that question because they haven't even opened their Bible this week. So I typically will start now with like, tell me, I want to learn more about scripture. What did you learn this week that you can share with me? Now, if, if they can't share anything with you, um, that, that, yeah, that can start a conversation of its own. But I'm always quick to share what I learned this week because there's always something I'm learning in scripture. I'm rethinking it. I'm, I'm maybe seeing it in a slightly new light. But I know that seems like it's a soft way in. But I'm telling you, if the reason why they can come back to you and say, yeah, you know, I think God is a God of X is because they're not reading their scripture. I think God would not do, not want to behave that would not respond this way because they're not reading their scripture. All of it, it turns out is built on the fact that they are biblically illiterate and they don't even understand the difference between the claims of Mormonism and the claims of Christianity. By the way, the Mormons are reading their scripture at a much greater intensity and at a much higher rate than the Christians are. So I think we have to, you know, like that old saying that people will do more for a lie than we're willing to do for the truth. That's, that's, I, I wish it wasn't a true statement, but it is. So I think for me, Jared, I'm spending more and more time as an old guy just talking about how scripture has changed. Because in the end, um, I know that if they want to hold a position that's sideways on a hot topic issue, they are going to have to hold it by either twisting scripture or not being familiar with scripture. So I, I always think, hey, if we could teach people how to read scripture properly and they were enthusiastic about doing it, we wouldn't have to have any of those other battles. Those battles are being fought because no one's paying attention to the scripture. So I think most of my conversations now are about, hey, what have you learned recently from Scripture? And let's get you excited. Let, let, let you be the person who's excited about Scripture. And, and then what you're going to have to do is get really comfortable with the fact. Now, I know this is going to sound terrible, but, but get really comfortable with the fact, Jared, that there's a broad pathway to destruction filled with people who call themselves Christians. And Jesus told us this in Matthew 7, right? He told us this. He said, you people are doing stuff in my name. You're healing, and do it, but I'm going to say I never knew you. And he immediately afterwards says, broad is that path, narrow is that gate. Well, that's because, and by the way, if they're doing it in his name, they're calling themselves Christ followers. <laughs> that, there's, that hasn't changed. That's still true today. There's tons of people who are doing things in the name of Christ who don't even know anything about what Christ has taught. And you know, it, we're not going to change that. That's that's an ancient principle, and it's still true today. And so, we, yes, I want my family to be in the narrow group, but I'm prepared for the fact that they may never be there because that's just the nature. We're so fallen and so lazy that we take everything for granted. Look, tonight is an NBA playoff game, and I know people who are more enthusiastic about the history of those two teams playing uh, than they are about the history of the Old Testament. They, they know the history of those two teams going back two generations. They don't know their own uh, scripture as Christians. We are enthusiastic about things that don't matter a lick. And so what I'm trying to help my own family, my own kids, is to be enthusiastic about the things that do matter. I often wonder if I have passed my fanship uh, for teams that I, <laughs> I'm a big sports fan. Have I done a better job of passing that? 
that I have of passing the discipleship part of what I'm trying to do as a parent, as a Christian, you know, I know that I spend a lot of time fixated and talking about anything from tennis to football to whatever it may be. And I'm thinking, really? Uh, my wife will sometimes say, as we're watching these sports shows when we're working out or whatever, and she'll say, this is all just a bunch of sports gossip, <laughs> like where people are talking for hours about things that haven't even happened. When you're in your family settings, I bet the people are willing to do that, talk about nothing. So I don't know, that might that might help you if you just kind of start to focus on, well, how deeply, how well do you know your scripture? Yeah, yeah, I, I like that because kind of like what you were saying, it's a way to kind of put the ball in their court with asking the questions and maybe at the same time kind of gently prod them a little bit to reconsider how much they've actually, how much attention they've actually paid to the Bible, which potentially could either help them if they are believers to see where they need to change their mind on some things, or maybe if they're not, might help them to see that and come to Christ eventually. Yeah, let me ask you this, Jared. So do you think there are times, if you're like me, there are probably times where you think, I could be more dedicated to reading Scripture. And and I sometimes wonder, you know, in, um, I, I not that I have doubts, but I, I sometimes wonder, am I committed enough? No, I don't get to the point where I'm like, well, I'm not even sure I'm a Christian because I'm not, I'm not interested and in, in, I'm not doing enough of this. I don't think this ever that kind of thing where you have to measure the number of hours you're spending doing scripture. But I often will have those kinds of feelings. And I think if I express those to my family members, you know, I don't know about you, but I sometimes feel like if, I, if as much as I'm supposed to love God, I don't seem to love his word enough to read. I mean, I read it every day as much as I can, but I feel like, wow, you know, there's a lot of time I spend on useless things that I could spend in the word. Now, if I just said that in front of people who spend no time in front of the word, you're, you're just helping them to see that they're the same as you, but probably a lot worse because they're not in the word at all. And without having to shame them, you can kind of just confess your own shame and it might have an impact on the people you're talking to. They may they think, yeah, well, I'm a lot worse than, than Jared is. If he's not, if he feels like he's not reading it enough, I'm not reading it at all. And that might compel them to actually take a step and do a little bit of reading. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That is good advice. And I appreciate it, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for calling. I really appreciate the call. Uh, we're going to get close to the end of the hour here. Uh, so we'll have on the backside, Jocelyn, hang on. We're going to uh, take your call on the backside in the next hour for sure. I uh, appreciate everyone who gets a chance to call in. It's 855-243-9975. So please call in for the next hour. We'll just uh, take a quick uh, st starting part of that hour. I'll give you a couple things I want to talk about, and then we'll get right into Jocelyn's call, and I want you to join me. This has been a great opportunity to sit in for Greg. Greg, if you're listening, I hope you're having a great time. And I'll see you back in the next hour at Stand to Reason.